A few months ago, I filmed a high-level explanation video about how display servers based on Wayland are different from the display servers running on X11. But as I said, this was a super high-level explanation without any technical detail whatsoever. And the main point of today's video is to zoom on on the Wayland source code and see what's actually moving in there under the hood and what are the main parts in the Wayland source code architecture. This video is still going to be very beginner friendly. It's still going to be fairly high level, but we're going to look at the code itself and I'll try to simplify it down to only a handful of key components so that you don't feel overwhelmed even if you're super new to this. That way, if you will ever want to look at the source code files in the future, it won't all appear just as a wall of code with no structure or meaning. And if you're serious about learning Linux, at some point you stop being comfortable with your level of knowledge and you would want to know more. So just the basic high-level approach won't make you happy anymore. And you might want to know more about the motivation of the developers and their reasoning for moving from tried and true X11 to something new and modern like Wayland. There's so many questions flying around on the internet. Why was it necessary? Why do we even bother doing something like this? What benefits should it bring? They say it's more secure, but why? The legend also says that it's supposed to be more suitable for the modern hardware. How so? These are just some of the questions I'm on a quest to understand and in the process share my understanding with you. And hopefully this will be helpful. And the first step in understanding something so technical like this is to look at the source code. There where it all begins. Now let's get to the topic. The Wayland source code is publicly available at the GitLab freedesktop.org and it also has a mirror image on GitHub. And there is also a decent explanation of many things concerning Wayland on the official website of Wayland. And these are all the sources where I did my research and tried to understand everything that I'm going to be talking about today and hopefully being able to provide a concise and good enough overview for you to understand. And I think in a sense it's more also a guide for myself so that I uh, can structure that knowledge, what I just gained from that research um, in my own brain. So let's go. And today I'm going to try something different and use the whiteboard behind me to try and make the information a little bit more engaging and a little bit more digestible. So as I mentioned, Wayland Compositor and the applications communicate using the client-server model, where in this model the Compositor serves a role of a server and the applications are clients. And the Wayland protocol is just basically a set of rules that helps Wayland compositors and applications to communicate with each other. It is basically just a recipe or blueprint for a much more complicated process. I tried to explain this in a bit more detail in the video that I posted in July. So it will show up right here somewhere. Again, just to remind you that the main difference between Wayland and X11 display server is just that in X11 architecture, the display server, the X server, and the compositor were two separate entities. And the communication needed to go both ways every single time a client application tries to do something. In Wayland, this is the main distinction because now those two things have merged and so that simplifies the message passing and it reduces the overhead a little bit and that way it's more efficient. Now before we go into the code, I'm going to briefly remind you of what are the main tasks that each of these is responsible for because it's kind of important to understand the code structure later. So one of the main tasks for the Wayland Compositor is composing windows. Basically if you have a few applications um, communicating with the compositor at the same time and they can do that and that's how it's exactly done. So they communicate with the compositor in parallel and you have multiple windows open on the screen. So the compositor decides where each window goes, how it's stacked, so which window is on top, where it's located, 
transparency, all kinds of decorations on these windows, uh, drag and drop uh, features and stuff like that. Okay, so that's this. But now, in contrast to X11, there is one thing that the Wayland Composer doesn't do anymore. It's rendering. Now, rendering in Wayland architecture is offloaded to the client applications. So now it's their problem. And so if we go over to the clients, we can say that they are responsible for their own rendering. Where rendering just means generating an image in the form of pixels. Then the application stores the rendered image as a buffer. Where the rendered buffer is just a chunk of memory that stores the result of the rendering process. And then it sends the request to the compositor to display that buffer. And as I said before, different applications can communicate with the compositor at the same time in parallel, but they cannot communicate between themselves. And I guess this is where the security feature comes in, um, at least partially, is that each application communicating with the server cannot share the data between themselves. And so now we can see that rendering is a big part that has changed compared to X11, where now it significantly reduces the number of things that the compositor has to do before it can display the image. So once the client sends the request to the composer to display the buffer, um, the composer will reply in some way or another, but what it cannot do, it cannot modify that buffer anymore because it's not responsible for rendering. It can add window decorations, handle transparency and other features, but the image itself is determined by the rendering on the client's side. And so unlike X11, where the X server tries to do everything, Wayland lets the clients do the cooking while the composer just serves the dishes. Now you've probably also heard that there are multiple composers. It's not only one composer that we're talking about. There are many depending on which Linux distribution you're using and which desktop environment this distribution is running on. So if you have Fedora, for example, you are likely using either GNOME desktop envir environment or using KDE Plasma um, or maybe something else. But these two seem to be the most popular. And KDE, for example, uses Kwin Composer. And there are others like Mutter, Hyperland, Westen, and so on. And what distinguishes these compositors we will see in a moment. Every composer has one thing in common. It's the core Wayland protocol, which is the same for every composer. So we have core protocol, and there are composer specific extensions. This is what distinguishes different compositors from each other. It's where the magic happens. Composer developers can tweak the core protocol to add unique features to fit their composer personality and the functions that they want to see there. And so now we've got this new set of rules, which is specific to each composer, and that set of rules will determine the communication between the composer and the application. And now we finally get to look at the code. So when you download your favorite Linux distribution, you typically get at least four files that come with this. These four files are the following. So we have Wayland XML file. And this is the file which contains all the rules that determine uh, the client side and the server side rules for communication. Um, it's written in the XML extensible markup language um, and it has about 3200 lines of code and it's fairly easy to read. It's both human readable and machine readable. But actually this is not the very root of where it all begins. It's a high level implementation of the more fundamental and low-level wire protocol, which is just a stream of 32-bit values.
The next file in the Wayland package is the Wayland scanner. So this file helps to take the Wayland XML instructions and translate them into a C code so that the client-specific and the server-specific uh, rules can be implemented or the messages passed between the Wayland compositor and the application. So this is like a translator. And then there is two more files, libwayland client and libwayland server. These both files are written in C and they are C implementation of the XML protocol, which this is a client-specific implementation and the libwayland server is the server-specific set of rules. And now we can go back to the computer and take a look how these files look on the inside. There's a very particular structure to them. Okay, now that we have identified these four files that are part of the every Linux distribution that defaults to Wayland, uh, we can go and take a look at how to locate these four files, how they look, what's inside them. And uh, there are two ways you can find them. So one is on the official Wayland repository on GitLab. GitLab freedesktop.org. This is where I am right now uh, and this is where I'm going to show you. And another way is also to locate these files on your own computer that is running Linux uh, with Wayland. So let's take a look. Um, there's a bunch of files in here um, but we are only interested in a few of them. So the protocol folder and the um, SRC folder. So if we go to the protocol um, there is this wayland.xml file that I was talking about. So it has all the rules. And then in the SRC folder, uh, you can find a wayland scanner file, uh, which is written in C, as I said. And then there is a wayland client and wayland uh, server. Again, the two files written in C, so Wayland server and Wayland client. So that's where these files are. But let's go back to the protocol file and let's open it. Up. And it may seem like a lot of stuff, but it has a very clear structure. Now, Wayland protocol is the object oriented protocol. Each object implements an interface and there are different kinds of interfaces. This one, for example, is called VL subsurface. But it also says that this is an additional interface to uh, another one, which is VL surface object. And that interface, like that block, defines everything that pertains to this particular object, contains another substructures inside of it. And so the two main ones are called messages, which are either requests or events. Requests are the messages that client sends to the compositor and the events are the messages that go from the compositor to the client. So let's locate them. So you can see here is a request and there is another request here and there's another. Okay, so that one only contains requests. I don't see any events in here, but they're surely part of the other uh, interface um, blocks here. Yeah, like here, for example, um, right there, event. So there's another object, which is called VL registry. And then there's a brief explanation. And again, two kinds of messages, requests and events. And so this is basically what Wayland protocol looks like on the inside. Now, I hope this video was helpful, at least a little bit. And I hope that when you get the itch to go and try and look into the source code of Wayland, you will no longer see just a scary wall of code. You will see a well-organized system that hopefully makes sense. So leave your thoughts in the comments. What can I improve in this type of videos? What I should change or keep the same? Um, I'm planning to make quite a number of videos in this style, if you like them. And I was looking into a few different topics that interested me. Uh, 
that are kind of the extension of what we talked about today. Uh, for once, I was really interested to see why do people keep saying that Wayland is much more suitable for the modern hardware? Because I really would like to understand that part. And so I'll share what I learned with you. And another thing that is also interesting is how the clients um, render their own graphics. I mean, this is maybe not directly related to Wayland itself. Uh, because, as far as I know, it happens with the help of other libraries, such as OpenGL, Vulkan, um, and whatnot. But anyway, I would like to be able to understand it at a much more lower level. And like, there's a range of topics we, we could talk about. And if there's something you find interesting, let me know, and I'll try to research it and break it down in a, a simple explanation. It, like as simple as I can. It's just, I think it's much more fun to learn together than on your own. And I think that's the main reason I'm doing this uh, because it's not directly related to what I'm studying, right? To what I'm doing as part of my physics PhD. But I would like to know a little bit more lower level stuff other than just superficial um, GUI level interaction, if you know what I mean. So. Thank you so much for watching, thank you for your comments, and I wish you a good weekend. Bye guys!